welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast with your charismatic host and prominent safety expert, Dr. David Perotin. Be entertained and informed as the Safety Doc discusses both best and bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. The truth will keep you safe. Follow Dr. Perotin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. Hi, everybody. This is David, and welcome to the Safety Doc Podcast. Hey, this is podcast number 38, Surviving the Dangerous Interface Between Probability and Prioritization. But you know what? I have a few working titles right now, so we'll see what this actually ends up being called. Um, Some things here. So I was actually going to call this back to school safety time to be terrified. But you know what? That probably deserves its own show. Um, Anecdotes. The Japanese beetle's trap in my maple tree is working. Um, first of all, Japanese beetles are not supposed to attack maple per every site I've ever read, but yet they did um, and seem to not do too much damage. But anyway, I have this trap that you have to open up and, and shake the beetles out. So shake them into this massive Ziploc bag and and then dispose of them. It's, it's pretty gross stuff, folks. But um, uh, yeah, kind of something I get to look forward to for as long as we live here for eight weeks in the summer of probably emptying this disgusting Japanese beetle trap that does seem to be effective, though, um, twice a day. So, hey, I was out on a bike trek. It's just wonderful, beautiful weather here. We've kind of gotten past the heavy rains in southern Wisconsin. And uh, all of a sudden, I'm on my way back after about uh, 40, 45 miles out. Um, and, uh, the bike is, is feeling a little bit like, I don't know, I'm like, dude, it's, it's a little sluggish, you know? So it's like, it's a flat tire, um, check in, check the tire pressure, pull the bike, you know, over, of course, don't do that while I'm riding the bike. Haven't mastered that skill yet. Um, but, um, you know, was checking the brakes, brakes seemed to be rubbing, loosen them up. Then I really didn't have much on the back brakes. And, but anyway, so I got home, wheel was spinning like way wobbly so i look at it and, and found out there was a broken spoke so I took it into the uh bike place uh which is completely awesome uh these guys are like been in business for 30 years have a small bike place it used to be in a bank so like their office is in the vault like this small bank um you know it was probably built in the 30s or 40s but um in the in the one guy like who does the bike repair wears a suit so wears like a black suit with a skinny tie and like a white shirt it's just the coolest thing and, uh, so anyway, um, yeah, so they're looking, they check out the bike and the greatest thing is like, they fix it right there. You know, we put it on the hitch, got to put the hitch on the car, you know, the bike thing and, and the bike hauler and get it over there and stuff like that. Um, they, they fix it. And then the guy's like, you know, all, all your spokes like are just weird tensions. And, uh, they're recommending that I put a new wheel on, um, or, or two new wheels in spring but uh, actually gave me a little bit of a compliment because I said, um, temp- typically once when you have someone who's stronger, who's biking, and I, I typically go pretty aggressive on the hills and stuff like that. They said the torque that you transfer to the hub then transfers to the spokes and, and puts a lot of pressure on the spokes and can just snap spokes. So you want to go with like a stronger wheel because, you know, you're you're using this bike for a little more aggressive purposes. I'm not off road or anything, but I'm like, Hey, that's, that's kind of cool. Um, you know, although they might say that to everyone, but I'm like, yay, fitness. Okay. Um, dun, 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 dun. I am uh, reworking the show, getting it back down into that one hour range. We had a couple of shows that went over an hour. Actually, the ratings on those were really good. Uh, thank you very much for your support on SoundCloud and and iTunes, uh, Stitcher, Blueberry, the, you know, the show is pretty easy to find now. And for those of you who do like to watch the Safety Doc podcast on YouTube, I'll continue to do that. Um, and, and definitely there's a number of you who, um, you know, have subscribed and go in and, and watch these shows. So um, glad to, to do that and make that available for you. Again, find the show, um, you know, consider subscribing. Uh, what's the worst that can happen, right? I'm not trying to sell you anything. Um, and, uh, it makes me feel, uh, cool every time there's a new subscriber. Hey, it crossed like a thousand Twitter followers, um, this week. And for me, you know, in the show that, that I, I think it's pretty awesome because, uh, back in March, I remember we were at Disney and, uh, Disney Orlando and, and I got 300 followers and I thought that was a pretty big thing. 
because I'm like, well, you know, people follow in, on Twitter, and, and that's really for the show. I, I really don't post much else there. It's just, uh, you know, different information about the show. Um, hey, you know, I have a favorite microbrew beer here from Wisconsin. Uh, actually, I actually had a piece of glass in it um, about a month ago. And uh, it wasn't it wasn't sharp. It, um, you know, it was kind of in the last swig. I'm like, hmm, that's a little different texture. Um, oh yeah, you know, it's fall marbles. I don't know what the the make is, but uh, had it happen again. You know, so brought it to the attention of the uh, specialty place uh, that that you know I, I get this from. So, you know, you keep doing that to your customers, putting glass, you know, in 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 the beer bottles. It it eventually is going to turn people off. So, um, you know, you, you gotta you gotta knock that off. Um, I'm not there yet, but if it happens again, um, hey, thanks to John Grant and the 405 Media at the 405 Media dot com for hosting the Safety Doc podcast uh, right from the start. You can follow the 405 Media at the 405 Media dot com. Um, think of it as a, a radio station, but of all podcasters. So you're getting uh, 24 hours of different uh, podcasts. The League of Extraordinary Podcasters, the 405media.com. This show airs at 2 p.m. Um, PST daily, so you can listen. And I'm followed up by uh, the Clary Podcast, um, economist and author Aaron Clary, who was once a guest on this show. And uh, always entertaining, and also um, you can check out the various pub uh, published works of Aaron Clary on uh, on Amazon. So yeah, the 405 Media. So I have a sign behind me. Um, so if you're watching this on on YouTube, um, it, well, it looks like there's a radioactive symbol behind me, which there is. It's just on the cover of a book, though. It's, it's nothing back there. It's radioactive. Um, and I am modifying the signage back there. That's not all done yet because the the sponsors, I kind of have more sponsor supporters for the show than what I have room, I think, for signage. So I got to I got to figure out exactly how I'm going to assemble these signs that I'm having made. So I've kind of put together different drafts and things like that. So, um, but any anyway, there it's ISS twenty four seven. It's not ISIS. Um, just just to clear that up in the background sometimes when the show gets cropped when i do um like uh, skype versions where it's half me and then half the other person it, it kind of gets cropped over so it, it gets a little obscure in the background and and just not to make light of that but it, it, it if you look at it kind of in that mode it, it's incomplete um no it's I, iss 24 7 um which has to do with large uh, venue um, incident management systems extraordinary. So, um, hey, I helped a friend move on Friday. Uh, she's moving or has moved. She's there now in Arizona, and she had a 26 foot uh, moving truck. And this this thing, uh, first of all, it was a bizarre day. It was a bizarre day because it was easily 80 degrees, if not low 80s, and such high humidity that. I could see my breath. I, I, I've, I've lived in, you know, I've been here 45 years in the state of Wisconsin. I don't, I don't really remember a day like that. Just this, this humidity where the dew point was like practically, um, at whatever, you know, you're, you're excelling. It was just crazy. And, um, and it, it there was a steady rain too, like this humid, steady rain. It was like a tropical type thing. And, um, so anyway, the, I'm I'm helping her and there's other people there load from this huge storage unit um, into this into this truck, um, this moving truck. And, and there isn't um, there aren't not steps. I don't know. I don't think I've ever seen a uh, moving truck with steps, but there's not a ramp. So like you have to take everything and and lift it like four feet high onto the back of this truck, and then there are people in the truck to move it. So, you know, quite a workout uh, to, do, to do this and, and with the temperature. So it's raining and it's raining pretty heavy. So it's like, what do you what do you wear? And so what I did is I have my firefighting turnout coat yet, which is obviously waterproof. Um, I put that on and, and wore that, which worked great. Um, although like I was just, my, my shirt was just sweat soaked. I mean, I was just like, whoa, just, just drenched after that. 
Um, but uh, I was glad, you know, glad to help out. I can just imagine anybody watching, like, you know, from from the road and looking, and they're like, what? "Is this a firefighter over there? Are they evacuating this this uh, you know this this storage unit because of you know like a flood or was there something going on there? You know, just crazy." But um, but no, uh, I did get a message uh, that she has moved. Um, her brother drove the moving truck. Uh, she built a house down in Arizona, uh, just a, a beautiful scenic uh, background. It had shown me some pictures, so I was glad glad to do that. Been been a good friend of mine for a number of years. Um, so today's show, we are going to be uh, talking about some excerpts from the best selling book Flow by. Okay, now think of this name, uh, Mahali M I H A L Y. I'm not going to spell out the last name. It is. Chiskiskis Ventia Mahali. Okay. All I can say is like, um, that's hard to get back on the back of a uniform. So if this, uh, if this person played any type of sports in high school or college, um, or at the pro level, um, you had to get that thing down to very small letters or you had to kind of start it like at the, the waist and move it up and wrap it around like the neck and then come back down. Quite a name. Um, so, so yeah, it, it is, the book is about the psychology of optimal experience. Uh, it fits in well with uh, the previous discussions about the Taurus, um, uses a lot of examples. And it, it's kind of written at a very um, direct level with its, with its examples. So there's sometimes I'm, I'm reading through this book thinking, um, yeah, like this, this example, it just took four pages about Julio and the flat tire on his vehicle and he's going to work and he doesn't have money to buy a new tire until he gets his paycheck. So he like is worrying at work about this thing. I'm like, okay, I kind of got that. Could have got that in two sentences. I didn't need like four pages to, to have it explained to me. But nonetheless, um, I, I think it does a nice job of, of really talking about the, this concept of like being in the flow or being in the moment or in the zone or stuff like that, which, which really exists. So I'm going to pull out some, some parts in that book and make, I make fun of it a little bit. Um, you know, right now, but I do appreciate the book. So, um, we then are going to talk about understanding the word probability. Uh, I'm going to provide some examples and, you know, probability is key to safety and decision making. I'll talk about one of the most common mistakes people make with probability and also how to avoid it. Um, so, and I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of get into this a little bit, maybe as a, a primer for a future podcast. Um, in the next couple of weeks, but the back to school safety hype is starting. Here's what will be happening at the schools in your community. And it's probably not all based in any type of research at all. So I'm going to go over some of that because, hey, there's 55 million kids that go to school every day, 180 days a year, except for the ones that skip out and go to movies and things like that. But, um, and, you know, a, a number of parents. So, so schooling, you know, a, a affects a lot of people. So that's why we're going to bring it in. And let us talk about flow. So, you know, from, from the, from the book. So flow, the merging of action and awareness, bringing those two together, action and awareness. And I'm going to quote, when all person's relevant skills are needed to cope with the challenges of a situation, that person's attention is completely absorbed by the activity there is no excess psychic energy left over to process any information but what the activity offers. All the attention is concentrated on the relevant stimuli. So basically, when you are, you know, this this quote unquote, you know, you're you're in in the zone when 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 something very intent is is happening, which can be in a disaster situation. Or it can be, you know, like if, if you're a pro golfer and you have to make like this putt and, and all of that stuff, everything else kind of fades away. You shut down your situ situational awareness and, and you just focus on, on that act. So that's, that is talking about the merging of action and awareness. Now this, the, the book talks about it in a very positive light, which it can, B. And with the examples that they give, they're all positive examples. But the problem too with being in the flow is you have to realize what you're you're giving up to do that. You know, your body has this this finite radar system of what's going on around it. 
And, you know, let's say you have so much energy to power this radar and everything else going on. Well, if you shut the radar off, you have more energy for some other things, but you lose the radar. Um, so you got to be careful, you know, I, I, I think in these understandings of, of what the flow is and, and what it isn't. So definitely, again, I'm not saying it's good or bad. I think overuse of it is bad. And I think you have to understand that um, if you really get to this high concentration level on on certain events, how to manage that and then also manage your situational awareness um, that that doesn't fade. It's like someone who's like really, 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 really focused and, and then something like obvious just happens and, and you know, takes them out. So um, as a result, quoting here, as a result, one of the most universal and distinctive features of optimal experience takes place. People become so involved in what they're doing that the activity becomes spontaneous, almost automatic. They stop being aware of themselves as separate from the actions that they are performing. Again, um, this was, I talked to, to Kevin Sullivan, actually, um, of, um, the the wait uh what if podcast but 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 kevin sullivan um rescued somebody from a burning vehicle in january of 2017 and in my discussion with him you know he talks about that that being in the moment of being there helping to drag this person from this this burning vehicle and and giving orders to to others who were bystanders to help him do this now he was an officer in the military and has has some some background uh, leadership that that tacit knowledge that came to surface, but as we go through, you know, in, in the thing here, people become so involved in what they are doing that the activity becomes spontaneous, almost automatic. He, he just went into automatic mode, and he talks about that, and they stop being aware of themselves, and and separate from the action they're performing. So when I was talking with with Kevin, um, you know, there were a number of things like he was kind of recalling, um, not quite sure about like when certain people came on the scene. So, you know, his situational awareness um, kind of kind of shut down, um, which is very typical. And he's highly trained and also, you know, works as a physician's assistant. So has a high level medical training plus high level, you know, officer military training. So when somebody of that capacity um, who is is very much in tune to looking for signs and symptoms and, and environmental awareness gets so saturated in into a rescue um, it, you know, I take that and I'm like, what does that mean for the rest of us who don't have that depth of, of training that like a Kevin, you know, brings to that situation? Um, it, it, it's, it, it's like, I remember, and I mentioned this before, I, I, I think in a previous podcast, but one of the things I learned in, in fire, fire training was, you know, situational awareness and always knowing, um, that you had an exit. No, you know, always, always monitoring that you had an exit, that you didn't get yourself too far into a situation where you didn't have an exit. And, and the other part was, um, you know, in, in, uh, you know, situational, situational awareness, um, you know, being aware of, of the people, you know, that, that are around you, but also being aware of your own, um, you know, fatigue and, 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 and things like that. Um, and, Anyway, um, so it's this whole thing of being in the flow, spontaneous, almost automatic. They become aware of themselves as separate from the actions, or they stop uh, being aware of themselves as separate from the actions that they are performing. So, again, athletes call that being in the zone. I was in the zone tonight. I just don't know. You know just the, the hoop, you know, it seemed 10 feet wide. Everything I was putting up was going. I could, I could see openings um, on the court developing seconds before they developed and stuff like that. Just this, this heightened awareness that people, that people have. And sometimes you're in the zone, sometimes you're not, you know? So, um, and it talks, you know, the book even talks about like workers being in the zone um, on, on their job. And um, so, yeah. I, I just I just think it's interesting because when you go in the zone again use this use this analogy um, going in the zone isn't a bad isn't a bad thing but when you go in the zone it's like you have so much energy you, you have so much to power you you know this battery and and if you shut off the the radar which is a situational awareness you kind of become one with what's going on um, you know, you might have more energy, more focus in there, but but that situational awareness, you're not really scanning your environment and all all of all of that. So, um, it is it's it's served well in the short term. So, 
my my thoughts, you know, um, on, on this this involves situational awareness while it happens. Recall of the time of being in the flow is inconsistent. And I, when I talked to Kevin Sullivan, I mean, Kevin, um, it, there were several times when he would pause and he'd say, well, I think this happened at this point, or I think this happened at this point, because, you know, you're not documenting as you're in the moment doing this rescue of pulling this person from this, this burning vehicle and getting him to safety. And and we know, I had this in an earlier podcast, we know that all memory degrades. We know that you, you forget 50% of, of what you experienced an hour, within an hour, it's gone. Um, and... It's very hard to, to you know, you, 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 there's so many things that happen during our day which we just process, but we don't then put into memory. So that that's the other part of this thing, too, is it's hard to remember of what you did when you were in the flow because you're probably not sitting there committing a lot of that into long-term memory. You're just processing it. You know, you're really focusing on processing things in the moment. Um, so, uh Let's talk here. Discretion, following one's gut feeling, tacit knowledge. It allows you to be in the flow. That gut feeling, yeah, where, you, where you're not stopping to, you know, you're, you're not in the flow. If you got to stop and say, hey, I got to run this past the flip chart and see what the flip chart says or, you know, the decision tree, something like that. No, you have discretion. You have gut feeling, tacit knowledge. You can call upon those. Um, you have a honed um situational awareness where you're very aware of what's happening around you so it can bring you into the zone you know so suddenly you know like if if um firefighting and, and something collapses or something like that you, you you're very aware of it you can react to it um, nothing is catching you off guard and then you can in, in immerse yourself into the zone um so you know if you're if you are consumed with worrying about scrutiny of your actions or if outside thoughts creeping into your thinking, then you're not going to be in the flow. So again, if I'm a pilot and I have to worry, like you know, the plane is is descending, and right now I don't know why, so I'm going to go through all of the protocols that the airline wants me to go through um, instead of just following my gut and doing what I think it needs to be done to save the plane. Um, and there are a number of instances in that that type of thing that happen um and also an emergency response you know like emergency responders waiting but until they get clearance um to to go in and um respond to a scene when you know maybe um so maybe it's very obvious you know that they that to them that they can go in and and to do that but yet they can't exercise that discretion they need to wait for that to go through a chain of leadership and then an order, which is good and, and both bad. But, you know, if you have discretion in, um, you know, a, a school, okay, let's say, you know, an intruder situation, and you're not going to have the principal making all the decisions. The principal might be, you know, isolated to a certain area. Everyone has to have the ability as an adult to make discretion, to act in the best interests of self and others for that context and situation. That's the thing. You can't be second guessed. You can't worry. You know, like Sully on the Hudson, you know, doing landing the craft on the Hudson, the aircraft, and saving everybody. And then, you know, later getting questioned by the airline, well, did you really do this? Or we think if you would have gone through, it's like, hey, dudes, dudes, he landed the plane and saved everybody, okay? This is what he felt he needed to do as a veteran pilot in the moment. Um, and you know, kind of had to go in the flow then with with this and 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 commit to it, and not be distracted by these outside things creeping in. Of like, oh, by the way, Sully, here's here's uh, another flip chart that we can go through. That's going to take us, you know, thirty five seconds when we really have twenty seconds left to impact on the water. So, um, yeah, the flow works well with negotiating non linear events, things that you're not anticipating. Um, so the problem with being in the flow too much is that you might end up going with a suboptimal sub option, okay? Uh, for example, people running away from the Twin Towers, and, and they join in a group like other people are running. So it's like, hey, they're running. I'm going to run too. So right now you've gone with that, that, that flow of people are, of people are running, um, and, and you become part of that. You assume the group has some collective knowledge or there is a leader, uh, someone out in front who knows what they're doing, but but you don't you you're not you don't really know that for sure. You're going with the flow um, because others are going with the flow, 
it, it shuts down. Then you don't have to think. You don't have to activate your heuristics of, well, what are, what are my other options here? Whatever. It's like, yeah, you know, it's just I'm, I'm doing this right now. I'm running. I'm running with a group or going. The group is going somewhere. Um, so it does, it does, again, have this ability to shut down your heuristics or your options. Uh, there's something in the movie San Andreas, you know, which, of course, is super dramatized where, um, you know, people are running in the wrong direction and, and the, the main characters run, you know, toward like the most stable, tallest building. Um, and, you know, that, that is showing where you're, you know, you're, you're still keeping your heuristics. You're, you're getting out of that, that flow of, of where you think everybody else is, is going. So you're like, instead of just committing yourself to the, to the flow, like I'm going to be in, in the flow. This is, this is the safe thing. Now I can shut down my mind. I can focus on running and maneuvering the obstacles like in front of me and jumping over, you know, things in the street and doing whatever I have to do. Well, um, the, the, so again, it's a suboptimal. That might not be your best option. There might be like a better option out there if you just, if you, if you contemplated it, but you kind of like stop considering options once, once that happens. So, um, so being in the zone and going with the flow are often described in pretty linear situations. You know, like a dancer will say, Hey, you know, I was in the flow, the, an actor, you know, like with this scene. Yeah. I was just going with it. It's just in the flow. Mountain climbers. I was one with the mountain chess players, um, things like that. Um, we need the ability to go with the flow in non-linear situations, such as evacuation, but also not get absorbed so that we no longer engage in situational awareness. And the opportunities that chaos will present to us. Chaos, remember we talked about chaos? The more chaos you have, the more noise in a situation, it shakes things up and options present themselves to you, okay? So you need to be aware of those of those options. And if you're just going with the flow and things become more chaotic, you're not aware of the opportunities presented to you by the chaos. Remember, chaos, chaos can be a good thing. The more chaos, the better. It's like the subtle entering chaos, a little bit of chaos is hard because you kind of still have choices on the table. More chaos, the better. Um, as far as decision making, remember more noise into a system creates more chaos, more chaos is better than less chaos. The choices become obvious in very chaotic situations, but are less evident in situations of lesser chaos. So we see this, for example, hurricanes, a hurricane of moderate strength, let's say a level two. It's a nightmare for FEMA when they do, when they have things like this, because the level two, it's hard to convince people to evacuate, you know. Um, and, you know, at level two, but it could go up to level three or level four. Level four is bad. You know, level three is not good either. But um, so a level two, though, people are going to be like weighing their options. They're going to be like, well, I could hunker down, you know, or hunker down and, uh, you know, uh, plywood up the, the windows and get supplies and, and, and wait this one out instead of trying to get on I-4 and, and hopefully get out of here. Um, so that's the thing. If someone rides out the storm once, um, it's gonna, they're, they're likely going to stay again, you know, even if the storm is, is more severe because they feel that they, they've made it. Um, so, and we get more into prob, you know, time probability here in a little bit about that. If the hurricane's a category four or a major storm, um, it's easier to obviously to convince people to leave. The problem is if, if you predict a level four and it ends up being a level two, then the next time it's a level four, it's going to be difficult to, um, um, to get people to go along with that. They're going to refuse to evacuate. They're going to be like, ah, I made it the last time. Don't worry about it. Um, so it's, it's very, it's a very hard call and people are rational. People expect the forecasters to be a hundred percent accurate. And they begin thinking of bizarre probabilities of how accurately the next storm will be forecasted. So even though like a technology might, you know, increase and things like that, it could be like, well, when this was forecast the last time a hurricane four came through, you know, 19 years ago, it turned out to just be, you know, some winds and rain. So, but it's like, okay, yeah, but we have advances in Doppler radar and we can pinpoint down to the street and, you know, we pretty much have this on and, and, and we think this is the prob probability. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's the hard thing. So, and, and people will be like, I go, you know, go with the flow. If I, you know, if it's, uh, it, thing blows off the window, then I'll put something else on it or, you know, we can do this or, um, well, you know, we're going to, we're going to make it work, made it work before. So, um, there are many things and I don't know, I shouldn't have talked Southern, uh, in a, in a, in a Southern dialect because I'm kind of talking Florida. And when I was in Florida, I met nobody who talked like that. 
um, you know, with that kind of dialect. But um, there are many things in everyday life that can disrupt the internal order of the life. Whenever information disrupts consciousness by threatening its goals, we have a condition of inner disorder or psychic entropy. Okay, psychic entropy is a disorganization of the self that impairs its effectiveness. So let's talk about that psychic entropy. Whenever information disrupts consciousness by dun, 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 dun. it just does. Okay. Whenever information disrupts consciousness uh, by threatening its goals, we have a condition of inner disorder. So it could be, you know, to where you came to work, you did have a flat tire on your vehicle. So all day you're, you're, you're thinking about that. It's disrupting your consciousness, your goal of what you're doing at work. Like, you know, can I pump that tire up and will it get me home? Um, and how am I going to schedule to, you know, get it in and, and get it looked at and all of these things. So it's stuff, it's stuff like that that disrupts. Like you can have an important meeting that you're doing or you could have, you know, something that you're attending to, um, you know, in your job and it's just, it just comes back in your consciousness because, you know, in your Taurus, your day, you're going to come back to this point where you're going to need that vehicle to get yourself home. And is that vehicle going to be reliable and able to get you there? So, hey, let us um, take a break right now. And um, here's a few words about the Safety Doc Podcast. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc Podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin. Author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant. Powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast. All right, thank you, and welcome back to the Safety Doc Podcast. So, um, what disrupts us? You know, a lot of a lot of things, a lot of things, folks. Uh, job stress, family stress. You know, your personal wellness. Hey, I'm not feeling well today. You know, I don't know. I got a cold. Ate that chicken salad. Something's not up to it. You know, I'm just not feeling great today, or didn't sleep well. Tired. Um, you know, finances, stock markets. You know, goes down or something like that. Um, social media. You know, something weird posted on social media. Just media in general. Um, there's so many things that impact us. Now, what I talked about there is something external. So, you know, like, like job stress, the media, but also internal, you know, like how, how you're feeling. Um, so, you know, they, it goes on both sides, but yeah, you know, those things creep into, creep into consciousness. And, um, so we need to identify what's external and internal and do what it takes to mitigate the things in life that are prolonged that end up weakening the self to the point that it's no longer able to invest attention and pursue its goals. So when you are like so freaked out of like, oh my goodness, I don't know how I'm going to keep doing this job, um, then you got to do something about that, okay? And if you're so consumed and addicted to social media in responses and getting wound up with that, you got to do something about that. Um, if you're if you're coming home and you're tired and you're just hitting the couch all the time and you look in the mirror and you know you're you had a you know if you put your belt on and it's like you know it fits a lot better if i put it like one or two settings looser than what it was and it's like oh you know i this isn't good i just got to do something about that. that that that's your consciousness you know you're not happy with with those things and and they're not going to get better on their own none of these things get better on their own folks you have to act and it, it's going to put you in an uncomfortable zone i i did an interview with marianne west of the sustainable living podcast talked about a change i had in careers back in 2014 
um, you know, which at the time, you know, brought about feelings of anxiety and things like that, uh, quickly evolved to a situation of uh, my health rapidly. It got better. Um, and, and just a ton of things I, I got to do that I never would have been able to do, um, and continue to do. And, and just like, it's such a better tra- trajectory than what it was on. But, uh, but you know, those aren't, those aren't easy steps, but you know, Hey, take them. So, um, so identify what's intruding in your mind. How do you do that? Okay. Here, here's how I do it. Here's how I did it. I don't, I don't do much anymore, but, um, at a time it was really effective for me. I would take a, take a walk, take a long walk or spend time. But usually if you walk, like if you're in motion, um, and then I had a recorder, a small recorder. It's like 40 bucks. I had used it for some of my dissertation recordings. It's really cool. Like a re- thing, thing was digital and handheld and it would record like 40 hours of, you know, like MP3. You could just upload it on, you know, and, and listen to it, um, and earbuds if you wanted to, um, but anyway, I would, I would record it. I would record my thoughts as I was walking. And, and not that I would necessarily have an agenda, but I would be recording. Um, and, you know, it, it was kind of funny because, you know, you have the recording. And if you ever pass somebody and you're walking, you have to, like, kind of make the recorder visible so you're not the crazy guy talking to himself, you know. But today with all these people, you know, with, like, the little headphone thing, you know, wrapped around the ear and stuff, it's it's gotten pretty, quote, unquote, normal to see people talking. But. But no, I mean, I usually do this, of course, you know, more out in a, a quiet type area um, and give myself plenty of time, you know, maybe an hour, two hours and um, just hold the, the the mic up and, and just start talking. Uh, what was in my mind, what I was thinking and then, you know, what what are, you know, what are some of the barriers to, to, to what I want to accomplish um, and, and just like how am I feeling, you know, what are what are some things that uh, I'm appreciative for? What are some things that are going well? How can I make things go better? How could I be more aware? And, and as you do this without a script and you just record it and then uh, you come back and, and you let it, you know, maybe sit for a couple of days and you play it back, like just in at a time, you know, when you can have, um, when you're not going to be interrupted and, and you can, and you can hear some themes and, and really get an insight, a reflection and introspection into your life. That was one thing I found from my research. Like no one has time or puts time forward for introspection and reflection. And you, and you can do this by just listening to yourself talk and not that you have to like evaluate your life and come up with all these decisions and stuff like that. It's just, you're listening and by listening to yourself, it's like, oh, I, I seem to like really focus a lot on the fact that, you know, um, I miss biking and, and how great it feels like when I was out biking and stuff like this. And you know what? Um, I haven't been biking like as much as what I did in the last couple of months. So I'm going to schedule a bike trip for the next couple of days. So I'm going to get that on the agenda. Or you know what? I, I talked about being more aware in the moment or, or getting setting my alarms. So. I get up earlier and kind of with no excuses on that, especially on weekends, stuff like that. Um, but, you know, here's things like I'm also thankful for. So I want to keep these things going. Like, always oh, play to your strengths, you know, like that's the thing. You don't give up your strengths. It's like, well, I got this going really well for me. So, um, you know, like the time, I'm, you know, maybe spending my, my yard and stuff like that. So it's like, well, if you if you do that, keep that going. I mean, that gets you out in the sun, gets you outside. Um, and, you know, if you have enjoyed, um, you know, just doing a day outing with, with the family, going going somewhere, doing a little bit of a hiking trails, whatever. But you're going to hear these things. You're not going to, in the moment, I mean, after they sit a while, you hear them, you're going to process them, they're going to make sense to you. So identify what's intruding in your mind. I, I, I like that approach of, of doing that in a, re, in a recording. Um, also, you can use a member check. So you have to, this is, this is a little bit tricky because you don't want to turn, a member check in research is when you get together with a few other people researchers or the people that know your your what you're studying um and and you you go through some of your findings now you know confidentiality and stuff if it's research that involves um you know personal information you can't share but if it's like you're coming up with themes and you, or your your process and things or like you know you can throw that by people like one thing i threw past a few people is like um here's my question set like other you know, researchers, people in the field that, that were my member checks. I said, but yeah, like people, I ask these questions, yet people don't answer these questions. Like they go off on this. So do you have any ideas of like how to change this question set or some follow-up questions I can give to everyone? Like I can give everyone a little 
contact by phone and, and ask like two, three questions. And people say like, yeah, like maybe ask him about this or ask about this. Or it seems like here you're almost like setting this up in this way. So that's helpful. But with a member check, that's where you have a really good friend. And you say to your friend, like, yeah, tell me if I'm, if I'm like positive, if I'm presenting well, if you know what you judge of my situational awareness, you may have to describe some of this to them, but just in general, like what, what are you seeing? And, and be honest with me because like if, if I'm, if I'm struggling or something like that, um, let me know and give me, it, it, not that they have to turn into a pseudo therapist. You don't want to do that. You don't want to put that on your friend because every time like if you start contacting a friend, they're like, oh my goodness, now I have to sit down and like listen to all the things going on. Even if it's not like directed at you and not as necessarily negative, that's not like hanging out with a friend. It's like, hey, we're going to go to this Cubs game. And by the way, like the whole time down, I'm just going to talk about all the things that, that are kind of, I'm not sure about or care, you know, I, um, they're bothering me or, or things like that. It's like, no, it's like, we're not inviting this guy back on the trip. Okay. Like, you know, it's a nice guy, but we don't want to, we don't want to get into this big philosophical, you know, trying to figure out Dave's mind. So, um, but yeah, I think periodically you can do a member check and, and, and give that back, you know, and give that back. I've certainly done that. Um, but you don't want that to be your, your family. I mean, I think there's something of value to sit down once, once in a while and to talk with the family, but that, that turns to be, um, you know, if, if you're putting too much of that into your, in, in, into your family, um, and asking for them to, to kind of analyze that information or reflect first, first there's positionality on that. I mean, the family has to live with you. So, you know, they're not going to be very raw with any feedback that they give you, but I think, you know, they can listen and support you. Like if you say, Hey, I'm, I'm going to hang out, um, you know, with, you know, whoever Gary and, and we're going to talk, you know, um, just see what's kind of going on and stuff like that. But, um, and again, you know, kind of sparingly, if you, if you find yourself like in this pattern a lot, um, you know, then, you know, too, there's therapists and stuff like that. But, but I'm just saying like, if, if you do have someone that you can honestly, how many, how many times do you go to, to someone like a friend and honestly say, Hey, like if I'm way off based on this, like, tell me, or tell me if I'm, if I'm starting to get a little, little loony on some of this, this, this stuff, um, you know, just, or just say, you know, Dave, you know, you need to, you need to take a walk or Pete, you know, you need to, I think you need to take a walk on this and, and, and think about this and think about the other people involved and, and kind of yourself too, or, or like, I, yeah, you know, like I have a friend that, that physically isn't, you know, what was really into kind of working out and some of that and, and has, has gotten out of that somewhat. And, and I'm just like, Ooh, I just, I, I don't see them as, as being as happy and stuff like that. And, so it's those delicate things like that because I mean those can quickly go into conversations like oh you so you don't so what like I'm not looking good like I let myself go or whatever I'm like well I'm not saying I, I, I'm just saying like I I know what you said when you want it, when you got out biking like early in the season that I, and and you love biking and running and these types of things and you just told me and it's just it's like July fifteenth you told me you just got out for your first run of the year you know so. um Definitely, you know, look at your, your priorities because this, this is really big to you. It always has been. And then it just contributes, you know, so much over to, you know, your clear thinking and, and stuff like that. Um, but that's where someone is just occupied. So get, you get out of the flow. So, um, it, you know, there's some things you can look at your priorities. What, what are my priorities? What are priorities matrices? Uh, or, you, know, you can figure out what are, what are my top priorities? You know, well, one is always yourself taking care of yourself because if you have a heart attack or stroke or you die, that helps nobody. Um, and you know, your family minimalism too. Like there's so many things like around this desk, my goodness, there's so many things I have, which like, I just don't need. And I have my collection of little fire trucks, like the, the grade type fire trucks that they put on raw road displays. You know, these, these people that, that put together these professional displays, these aren't the kind like you'd actually play with as a kid because they're too fragile, but they're very, very authentic looking. Um, you know, just some other things, but I'm like, Oh God, I don't need like, I don't need most of this stuff. And it's not like I'm acquiring things either. Um, so the things we're doing, you know, like we're renovating a bathroom and stuff like that. Well, that's, you know, that stuff will use itself will be there. But as far as like, you know, buying things, like I used to have this really cool, expensive watch, like really high end. And I remember like I sold it on eBay and, and it did okay with it. it. got nothing like what I paid for, it. but I just didn't use it anymore. Like you don't need it and stuff like that. I wasn't going to keep it. 
Um, but at the time I got it, it was, you know, kind of almost like a status symbol and I would wear it to like important meetings and, you know, have my, my big important watch out there, but just goofy stuff. I don't care about that anymore. Um, so, but yeah, again, when you're occupied on situations, your situational awareness dial gets turned away, gets turned down, things like that. So anyway, hey, let us take a break. It is time for trivia. Safety dock trivia. Okay, guys, here we go. Trivia. All right. All right. Bad karma. 40% of car thieves admit they left their keys in the ignition. I guess. Um, all right. Uh, what do California, Delaware, Florida, Oregon, Idaho, Kansas, Nevada, New Hampshire, Wyoming all have in common? You know what? They're all cities in Ohio. Plan your trip. Plan your vacation. Try to hit all of them. All right. And uh, now you know room temperature. There's actually a room temperature. It is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. And the highest point in Pennsylvania is lower than the lowest point in Colorado. So, oh, my goodness. Goodness. People right now listening to this in Pennsylvania are like, oh, you, you've got to be kidding me, David. You did not include that in your trivia moment. I'm like, yeah, I did. Sorry about it, folks. All right, let's end up here with probability. Uh, so we talked about the flow, and the flow seems to imply some predictability in an outcome. You're much better off being in the flow when you understand fundamental probability, which we're going to talk about right now. So probability... Here, you ask, what are the chances of that happening? You know, that's a good question. And understanding chance is understanding risk. So it's really an important question for survival, right? Uh, per Cornell University, the chance of a shooting at any school in America is once every 13,300 years. Um, we'll look more into that figure in a bit. We'll break it down and get it into probability per day. So probability helps us deal with the unknown, Okay. Helps us deal with the unknown. So there's, there's a plus to probability. This is, it's both good and bad as we tend to lean heavily on the most recent experiences. Remember I talked about like the hurricane? It's like, well, the last three times we've been through this, whatever. It's like, well, the last hundred times, here's what the data shows versus like the last three times. But people tend to remember the most current events and kind of base their decisions off of those. Um, which is not good for probability. <laughs> We'll talk about that, too, where over the long-term probability stabilizes out, and the short-term probability is kind of all over the place. Uh, so let's take severe weather alerts, for example. If the last five warnings for your area didn't result in any severe weather affecting you, you probably aren't going to be as vigilant about the sixth warning. So it comes on TV, and they're like, you go to an interior room or a solid location or whatever and alert your neighbor. I don't know if they do that as much. Used to, for a while, there, it was like, oh, it's alert an elderly neighbor or someone friend. I'm like, not a bad idea. I mean, if you give them a call or something. But, like, you know, um, I anyway, uh, I've known people that have stayed upstairs watching TV when they should have had it to their cellar or a safer room in their house. And people that just would always say, oh, yeah, they did the tornado siren. I just stayed and was doing whatever I was doing. Okay. Um, I had a relative um, whose house was struck by a tornado, and they actually were making their way into the basement. And when they were at the top of the stairs, a tornado hit and threw all of them in the basement. So, um, but it's one of these things, too, where it, it's this probability. It's like, well, you know, the last five times the weather person was on and claimed this, um, it never happened. So, but anyway, funny thing with that is, like, I was watching, um, we, were, we were vacationing up in Superior years ago, and they literally broke in to track this storm for, like, two, three hours. It's like, it's across here, now it's over here, and the guy would break in, and the weather person, and... It's, you know, the storm is 100 miles from us, but, you know, it's it's kind of a personal thing now, and this is where it's at, and it's down here, and we've sent whoever, you know, Sarah and, and Mike in the van, and, and they're going to they're, they're gonna report live, you know, and it's like, it's, the storm's gone. Storm's gone. It's like in another state now. So, 
Um, so, yeah. Um, life is a sequence of unpredictable events. Even though we expect similarity and the Taurus or things to be generally the same day to day, we, we really break things down moment by moment. We realize life is unpredictable. Our lives and our lives of everyone else are unpredictable. You'll spill some coffee. A button falls off your shirt. The card reader at the store isn't working. Uh, it's suddenly clouded over. It looks like rain. You didn't bring your rain jacket. Hey, your child's school called. Hey, get sick. Please pick him up. Uh, probability is the percentage of times that an outcome is expected to happen. Again, probability is the amount of times that an outcome is expected to happen. For example, hey, there's an 80% chance of rain today, meaning eight out of 10 times on days with these conditions, it's going to rain 80%. Grab the raincoat or the fire jacket, I guess, if you're me. Uh, probability of a school shooting at any specific school can be calculated as follows. Remember, we said once every 13,300 years, so what I did, take 180 school days, kids in school, multiply that by one or 13,300 years, you come up with 2,394,000 days that kids would be in school at that school, saying they're in school 180 days a year. So basically, a chance that becomes 1 in 2.4 million probability um, that that school would be involved on any given day in a school shooting. That comes down to point zero 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 four percent chance of a school shooting at any given day at any given school in america so at that specific school um however it you know this it's such a sentinel event it's so visceral it's so media covered that we assign much prioritization to it although the probability is actually very low I'm not saying we shouldn't prepare for it i'm just saying we have to understand these two things the, the the probability of something like that is fractional. It is so fractional. Let, let's compare that to something that's, that's more probable. Um, the odds of being struck by lightning are 1 in 700,000. So we said it's 1.24 million for being in a school during a school shooting. 1 in 700,000 that you'd actually be hit by lightning. So 4,000 people have been killed by lightning since 1959. So with the understanding of this probability, um, should we have a lightning strike alert system for schools? Well, you know, some do. They actually have these outside now that they put up on the playing fields, and, and it detects the weather conditions, and it gives an alarm if it says, hey, you know, there could be like a lightning strike, and then everybody comes in. So people are recognizing the probability of these, these types of things. And again, that probability of a lightning strike being higher than the probability of um, a shooter. You, you could have a lightning strike, you know, people on a field, um, a number could be injured or killed. So so there's this tricky interface between probabilities and priorities, probabilities and priorities. Um, and you can see this, you know, strongly influenced by recent events, political influence, bias, what's important to you. But it, that that's an area I wanted to make very clear is the probability of a school shooting is is much lower than the probability of being struck on a school playground uh, outside of school by lightning, okay? Even adjust it for the number of days per year and things like that that should be out versus inside and stuff like that in time. Um, probability works well in determining long-term behavior, but it doesn't work well for predict predicting outcomes in the short term. And with that, so let's see, probability works well in determining long-term behavior, but it doesn't work well for predicting outcomes in the short term. You know what? It is time to hear again about what people have said about working with the safety doc. So let's hear a little bit about uh, some of the people that I've that I've worked with. Thank you for tuning in to the Safety Doc podcast with the nation's leading safety expert, Dr. David Perodin, author, radio show host, university instructor, researcher, expert witness, and consultant powerful testimonials. Dr. Perodin has a strong reputation as the go-to safety consultant, and he was still able to exceed our expectations. When we went looking for an expert in the field of crisis preparedness and prevention, David was the single person we pursued. Not easy stepping into the touchier subjects of life, but Dr. David pulls it off. Take a listen. Now, Back to Dr. David Perodin and the Safety Doc Podcast.
All right, welcome back to the Safety Doc Podcast. As we get into our last segment here, we're going to end up with uh, probability. Um, and and you know what? We are going to save this 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 um, school emergency. Um, the, the, the school, what do we say here? Back to school, time to be terrified. The high drama, multi-agency drills. You know what? We're going to, that's going to be its own episode. And so I'll make it, we'll make it, you know, the, the next episode. We'll, we'll get it in before school. And we're just going to focus. It's only about a page long. And that, that entire page is going to get in, into the show because we're going to talk about, um, staff, administrators, students, just what, what to expect. Uh, both from the good and, and the bad, and, and, and how to, to make the, the most out of being prepared um, for school safety. So back to school safety. But right now we're talking probability works well in determining long-term behavior. Let's use a simple binary uh, two options probability model. This is common, and it's basically like yes or no. It's like flipping a coin, heads or tails. So you can flip a coin ten times. What's the probability that five times it'll be heads and five times it'll be tails? So, you know, probably not that, that much. You know, you could have, it could be all 10 times it could be heads. But you know what? Let's change it. You flip it a thousand times. What's the probability that it'll be uh, heads 500 times and tails 500 times? It'd probably be pretty close to that, okay? So the fact is you, you have this, um, you have this dampening effect the more data that, that you introduce in this binary situation. It's got to be this or that. So over time, it's going to level out and you're going to, you're going to get, um, toward that, that 50%. So even in the short term, though, you could have variation because every time you flip it, you know, it, it is a unique, it's a brand new opportunity for a 50 50. It's not like someone sitting at a, at a, you know, slot machine and saying, well, this, this poll, because I pulled eight, you know, 800 times and I've lost, you know, the next, I'm, I'm getting closer to getting luckier. It's like, no, every time it is the same exact percentage that you're going to hit the jackpot as it was the, the time before. So, um, so, and, and note that there's no learning curve going on here. It's not like the coin learns. It's not like your technique gets better to flipping the coin. It's like, I flip it this way and then it lands on heads. It's like, that doesn't happen. There's no learning involved in, in probability for that binary thing of, 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 you know, like flipping, flipping a coin. So, um, now, you know, with that said, we can get more information into systems that, that identify probability. Remember, we talked about the hurricanes. We know where, like, now we can get into these advanced radar systems and, and, and prediction models based upon that and, and sampling of the clouds and stuff like that. So we can get more data to inform these decisions and probability, um, come, you know, can come out of that. Um, so, so that's definitely there. That, that, that's learning through acquiring new information. But these things of binary, you know, like it's the, the flip of the coin, um, you know, um, is it, yeah, heads or tails, that's, that's always going to eventually balance out, in, you know, close to this, this 50, 50, 50 over time. In the short term, you know, that, that's why I think it's really important. The learning, what, what I'm trying to tell you out of this is get to know, like situations, get to know people over time, and then make your decisions based off of that. If you start a job, and the job um, you're having, it, it, it's not going great for you right away. Um, you know that part of that's that's getting used to it, is acclimating stuff like that. Or if you move to a community and things like that. But over time, as as you know, you, you get into your Taurus and get into your routine, and you get to understand things. Um, does, is it starting to, to level out for you? You know, are you are you feeling better about it, or you know, are you having more you know some some balance in that of days that, that you're really feeling good about it, days that you're not? If you just continue into that, and it's this gut feeling of like this isn't getting better, like I've got to do something, this isn't getting better, or my health's not getting better, I'm not sleeping, I'm anxious, I'm just getting more anxious. Um, you know, then your your probability on this stuff is like over time. Time's not going to make things better. Time is just going to prove to you that this isn't a good fit. You got to get out of here. You got to take care of yourself. This isn't a good fit because it's not going to happen on your own unless you do some action. I, I, I want to just, you know, wrap up with um, an appreciation for being able to talk about this concept of the flow, being able to talk about probability, what it is, what it isn't, knowing that in the short term, probability doesn't serve you very well. In the long term, it serves you a lot better. So, hey, this is a safety doc. 
Next week, you know what it is? It's our back to school special where we get into back to school safety and all the crazy stuff with that. I'm gonna I'm gonna take the rhetoric out, really tell you what you need to know, what the administrators are gonna be doing, the school staff, the students, all this. And hey, I'm not for these high drama drills. And if you see them, I don't believe them at all. So this is the safety doc. Have a great week. Enjoy the last part of uh, our summer here. Thank you. <laughs>